Okay. Hello and welcome class of 2020 to the last lecture. Um, Anya's going to give a little intro to tonight and then we'll let Professors Bridges and Ross take it away. Um, we want to thank you all for joining us tonight to celebrate this last moment together as a class before we all move on to do great things. Um, Liv and I toyed with the idea of organizing this event earlier in the semester, but after campus closed and it became clear that we weren't coming back, we found that it was more important than ever to make sure that this happens. Um, like you guys, we're all huge fans of Professor Bridges and Ross, um, so asking him to speak was a no-brainer. Uh, before we sign off, though, we want to thank you all for being so resilient, strong, and hopeful. We knew the class of 2020 was special. Who else would care so much about the size of the word law in a logo? But clearly the designers did it. Um, but seeing how you've all handled a global pandemic in stride and in community reaffirms for us how proud we are to be, uh, to call you classmates. Um, thank you for an unforgettable three years. And without further ado, Professor Zach. Thank you, Anya. Thank you, Liv. Hello, class of 2020. Congratulations. Woohoo! Well, my son would call me cringy right now. Um, I am Bertrand Ross and sharing the virtual stage with Professor Kiara Bridges. And this is your last lecture, at least for those of you who pass their classes this semester. For the rest of you, I look forward to seeing you in the fall on Zoom, of course. Now you've all come a long way from that beautiful day in August 2017, showered, freshly groomed with that first day of school outfit to let people know who you are about, what you're about. You walk by Strada and the fountain, looking up at that beautiful windowless cement block of a building that could easily be retrofitted into a prison. Walking through those glass doors and into those halls, you have nervous butterflies and excited sensations. Some of you are thinking to yourself, I'm about to own this joint. Many others are thinking, what in the hell am I doing here? Now you walk into the classroom. Most of you are walking into civil procedure where you'll be initiated as members of Oppie's Posse or start to hang with the far hang. Others of you are checking out whether a life in crime will play with criminal law with the Chuckster or the Rothlord or the good suit. And the rest of you are finally going to figure out what a tort is as you take torts with shorts. And you're thinking, let's do this. Now for 133 of you, it is 8.25 in the morning. And most of you have shifted to the mode of thinking, what in the hell am I doing here? But there are a few others, and you know who you are, who think otherwise, waiting eagerly for that first question to show off everything you know from your summer study of civil procedure, criminal law, or torts. It's showtime. Now let's fast forward to April 2020. Showers are now optional. Grooming is out of the question. The outfit is sweats and a t-shirt. Now the t-shirt might rotate, but the sweats are staying on for the whole week. The law school is so amazed by your progress as students that it decides to let you stay at home and learn the rest online. And you are ready for this challenge. Some of you connect to Zoom. Those who do so dutifully mute the mic so that the professor will not be disrupted by the daytime television in the background or the toilets flushing. Worried that others might notice that you have not left your bed or that they might track your unchanging clothing attire, you decide it's best to turn off the camera. And then you start to think, well, if the camera is off and I'm not on call, what's the point of me staying in the room? Plus, the professor has been telling me to get some fresh air anyways. But your brilliance easily overcomes it all, and you dominate that Fed court's exam. The leader of the Tyler Brigade thought, thought you might need six hours to complete that exam, but you do it in two. Family law? Shoot, sure. you got a family, and you know law. Next. Constitutional law? What constitution? There's a good reason why I didn't take constitutional law into my 3L year, since I came here to learn about law, not a bunch of bull donkey. Next. And then there are some of you out there trying to re remember whether you took all the exams you're supposed to take. Now, don't worry. I, I think that the Registrar at Student Services will let you know if you didn't. Now, I personally cannot wait for your brilliance to be on full display when I have the fortune of, of reading your exams next week. So you're graduating in the middle of a pandemic. That's just some shitty timing right there. But we're going to make the best of it in, your, in our 50 minutes together. And here is a silver lining. I have no memory of my law school graduation. And it was only 14 years ago. 
I can't remember who the commencement speaker was. I can't, can't remember what I was feeling. I can't remember who I talked to during the ceremony or who I sat next to. Although I think they sat us alphabetically. Don't know, can't remember. The only thing I remember was that super awkward lunch at Chili's with my parents who divorced when I was three. Dag, that sucked. But for all of you, this will be a graduation you will never forget, and probably more so than the graduation you will actually have next spring. And since I came to this graduation, I hope you will give me permission to skip the next one. I'm just kidding, I'm, I'll, I'll be there, I'm playing. I'll, I'll be there, just kidding. Okay, so Professor Bridges and I are here for your last lecture, which may or may not be part of the memories you take with you. What I'm thinking is that there will be a sharp and distinct memory of the nuggets of wisdom and inspiration that Professor Bridges will share, and a vague memory of some other short black guy that talked about something or the other. It might not be clear to you how you knew that the guy on the other side of the camera was short, but somehow you did know. Anyways, let's move on to the memorable, memorable part of the lecture um, and to the first part of the last lecture with Professor Bridges. Well, thank you so much. Um, it's such an honor to be asked to give a last lecture, um, and especially to do a co-last lecture with Bertrand Ross, one of my favorite people on the faculty. Um, so thanks to everybody who made this happen. Um, so um, we're going to share some life lessons with you. I'm going to share two of my life lessons, and Professor Ross will share two of his. And so my first life lesson for you is that you should embrace uncertainty. Things that are certain definitely offer a sense of security and safety. Um, however, there is beauty in uncertainty, and at times, uncertain paths lead to possibilities that are as wonderful as they have been unimagined. So in order to provide some context about this life lesson that I've chosen for you, um, I would like to tell you a little bit about myself. So my first year in law school was without a doubt the worst year of my life. Um, so there were a lot of non-law school related things that made that year difficult, but the main reason my first year of law school was the worst year of my life was law school. Um, my first semester, we had to take contracts, torts, and civil procedure. To me, contracts was about an instrument that people use when they don't particularly trust one another. I thought that was negative. It didn't sit well with my spirit. Um, in torts, people were always getting hit in the head or kicked or spit on. thought that was negative too. Um, and I didn't know what civil procedure was exactly about. The cases always started off interesting. A train that left New York collides with a train that left Pennsylvania. I'm in it. Bodies are strewn all up and down the New Jersey Turnpike. Fascinating. I'm in it. There is only one survivor. What? Engrossed. Can he sue in a Connecticut court? Who cares? Who cares? You lost me. That's where you lost me. And the second semester of well, um, we had a con law property law and a class called Foundations of the Regulatory State. The only class of this motley crew of courses that seemed remotely interesting to me was con law. Indeed, con law had a lot of potential, especially the part where we started talking about individual rights. But we spent a lot of time on Lochner v. New York. A lot of time on Lochner. And while I appreciate the import of Lochner now, I couldn't get into it when I was in 1L. I mean, I thought that it was really sad that on average, people who worked in bakeries didn't live to see much beyond their 40th birthdays. But in my 1L mind, I went to law school to talk about law. If I wanted to talk about bakers, I would have went to a culinary institute. But more seriously, my first year of law school was the worst year of my life because I spent that year worrying that I had made a terrible mistake. I had come to law school because I was interested in studying the relationship between race, class, and gender but none of my law school classes spent any time exploring race, class, and gender. Instead of concluding that there was something wrong with the first year curriculum or something wrong with the way those courses were being taught, I concluded that there was something wrong with me. So I was a sad, alienated, anxiety-ridden 1L. 2L presented the first opportunity for me to take an elective, and I chose to take critical race theory with Professor Kendall Thomas. I do not overstate things when I say that that course changed my life. One of the most exciting ideas that the seminar introduced to me was the idea that race is a social construction. Race exists because we have created it. And we have created it because it serves purposes. It moves wealth and opportunities towards some people and away from others. 
It justifies inequality, inequality in a country that purports to be committed to equality. It naturalizes profoundly unnatural conditions. Moreover, CRT introduced me to the idea that if race exists today, it is not because we have inherited it from our past. Rather, if race exists today, it is because we continuously and constantly create it in the present. In 2020, we are not simply living with the racial categories that we created back in the 1600s to justify chattel slavery and the extermination of indigenous people who lived on the lands that will come to be the United States of America. Rather, CRT says in 2020, it makes sense to talk about Black, White, Asian, and Native races because we constantly produce and reproduce those racial categories. Moreover, CRT says that one of the most important tools for producing and reproducing race is the law. It is contracts, it is torts, it is civ pro property con law, it is the regulatory state. Y'all, CRT got me hype. And I made two important decisions while I was in that seminar in my 2 well year. The first decision I made was that I wanted to spend the rest of my life studying how the law creates and recreates race, class, and gender. The second decision I made was that I wanted to become a law professor. Cool. The problem was that the path to becoming a law professor is a long one. Moreover, the path to becoming a law professor is not one that is guaranteed to lead the person on the path to a job as a law professor. And I'll just explain a little bit. One of the paths to the legal, legal academy is through grad school, through getting a PhD. And as you may or may not be aware, PhD programs tend to be long. Indeed, most of them are at least as twice as long as law school, two times. Further, for every job as a law professor that is available every year, there might be 10 or more people vying for it, which is to say simply because you have a shiny PhD from somebody's grad school, it doesn't mean that you're going to get a job as a law professor. Complicating things for the 2L version of me, um, what, who was pursuing this, uh, who was contemplating pursuing the path of a legal academic, was that I pretty much already had a job. I had an offer to be a summer associate at Cravath, and back in those days, you really had to mess things up during your time as a summer associate to not be made an offer to join the firm after you graduated from law school. So that's the choice that 2L me was facing. I could take the job at Cravath that was staring me in the face, or I can set off down the six to eight year long path that may or may not end up with my becoming a law professor. To reiterate, the choice was to make certainty my bay and enjoy the security and safety involved with taking an already existing job that paid a lovely salary, or I could embrace uncertainty and pursue my wildest dreams. So I chose the latter, and it was the best decision I have ever made. And I say that it was the best decision that I have ever made, not because I ended up getting a job as a law professor. I did, of course. It was the best decision I ever made because the eight years that it took me to become a law professor after graduating from law school those eight years were filled with experiences that there was no way I could have even imagined I would have. So to be precise, going to grad school as opposed to going to Cravath allowed me to continue dancing. I started taking ballet when I was three years old and I had danced professionally all throughout high school, college, and law school. If I went to Cravath, I definitely would have had to stop dancing. It is impossible to work 80 hour um, weeks at a law firm while still dance, dancing three plus hours every day. But in grad school, I was able to continue dancing. And my dance career ultimately took me all over the world. And so I would like to share my screen to show you just some images. Um, these pictures really don't need any captions, but you know, this is just some fierce solo realness in France. Um, this is, uh, this is me, um, yeah, this is probably murder one on a photo shoot in New York City. Uh, yeah, it's another dead. The photo shoot did not survive. Yes, killed it, murdered, dead. This, yeah, I had to, I had to get on a plane this time, you guys. I had to get on a plane to serve this realness in Poland. And let's see, what's this one? Yeah, you know, sometimes you just need to serve pure, unadulterated drama. And this is what I was, this is what I was serving this. So, which is to say, I have danced on the world's biggest stages, and I've shared a stage with one of my favorite people in the world, my favorite dancer in the world, rather, Misty Copeland. I've shared a stage with Misty Copeland twice. So most importantly, when I was looking at the certainty of Cravath on one hand and the uncertainty of the path to the Legal Academy on the other hand, I had no 
idea that I would find a dance career as fulfilling as the one that I've had along the path to the legal academy. It was unimaginable. I had to embrace the uncertainty to even imagine the gifts that ultimately came to me. The present moment is terrifying. <laughs> we are all facing so much uncertainty, but I fully believe that the uncertainty is a blessing. And I'm gonna do my best to embrace it. My first life lesson for you is to try to do the same because there are unimaginably wonderful things in the face of uncertainty. And I'll turn it back over to Professor Ross. Thank you, Kiara. Now, the first part of my lecture is titled, When My Four-Year-Old Daughter Dropped the F-Bomb, or How to Be a Revolutionary. It was week six of shelter in place and the Ross Milligans were enjoying family time together on a lovely Saturday afternoon. Four-year-old Esme and dad were playing chess. Well, sort of. It was more the dad playing chess and Esme moving the pieces in ways that they aren't supposed to move despite dad's instructions. It was frustrating for dad, but so much better than the alternative. The alternative had been several days of hangman with a child who hasn't quite mastered all of her letters and cannot spell any words beyond mom, dad, and some of her brother's name. It was therefore always disconcerting when she wrote enough lines for a 12 letter word because there's no way she knows how to spell a 12 letter word. And then the game would begin with me guessing letter after letter after letter. Occasionally she would acknowledge an accurate guess and put the letter in a place it could not go for it to be a, a word in the English language. But on we go until I get to the last letter of the alphabet and we are working on the hairs of the toes of the man hanging from the fictional gallows. It is a pretty violent imagery for a four-year-old, but she doesn't seem to mind as she cackles with every supposedly wrong guess I make. After letter 26, there are only four spots filled in the word. It's a word that starts with Z, followed by a G, with an R in the middle and a B at the end. She cackles, keep guessing, daddy. I tell her there are no more letters to guess. She responds gleefully, yes, there are. And frustratingly, I work through the alphabet again as we add armpit hairs to the man hanging from the fictional gallows. Now, every one of you would take a game of chess with a four-year-old who is unwilling to accept limits on how pieces move over that experience with hangman. Now, despite my disadvantages in the game of chess, I somehow managed to put her king in jeopardy. I proudly announce, check. My daughter then pauses, stares at the board, seeming to think intensely about what to do next. I am besides myself. This is a breakthrough. I am raising a four-year-old chess prodigy. All along, she was just pretending not to know how to play. She knew all along, I am so damn proud. Now, after about a minute, she says in a hushed voice, W-T-F, except she didn't say W-T or F. What the F-bomb? Now, it took me a minute to process it all. I mean, the F-bomb sounded more like Falk than, well, the F-bomb. So I just casually inquired, what did you say, Esme? W-T-F, except she didn't say W-T or F. Now, our four-year-old daughter seemed to be a bit young to be dropping F-bombs. Our 12-year-old son has still not dropped F-bombs in front of us, at least. And I started to think back to my own childhood. My path to the F-bomb was much more incremental and cautious. I was a child raised in an era of authoritarian parenting, so I had to test things out step by step. So I started with dang. My thought was that dang wasn't really a curse word. It's kind of a play on a real curse word, so I couldn't get in trouble for saying that. And I was right. Soon I was saying dang it all the dang time, and it brought me great joy. But a few months later, I decided I was ready to take the next step with damn but I was never nervous about going full on damn because there's no dispute that damn is a curse word. So I instead started with Hoover damn. My thinking was that I can't be punished for saying a place, a place that some describe as one of the man-made wonders of the world. Hoover damn, I yelled when I missed a basketball shot that I should have made. I looked around to grandma, no reaction. Grandpa, a look of puzzlement, but nothing too negative. Uncle Mark, Auntie Lisa, not even paying attention. Yes, Hoover Dam it is. But then I got sick of saying Hoover. I came from a Democratic family. President Hoover, a Republican, is considered one of our worst presidents for not pursuing policies that would have avoided the Great Depression. So I decided several months later that it was time to drop the Hoover. 
So one time when I couldn't get Mario to jump over the mushroom in Mario Brothers, I yelled, damn, without the Hoover. What did you say, Grandpa said? Looked at me sternly. Um, um, I said, Hoover, damn. I ain't hear no Hoover. Don't you ever let me hear another curse word come out of your mouth in this house. And that was the end of that. I even stopped saying Hoover, damn, at that point for fear of bleeding off the Hoover and stuck with the dame. It ultimately took a trip out of state to college in Colorado, to Colorado when I could pick up, incremental, pick up the incremental evolution to the F-bomb. But don't worry, I did get there. Now, as a parent of a four-year-old who has just dropped the F-bomb, my, my mind immediately shifted into asking, who taught her that word? It must have been one of those ruffians in her pre-K class, that little Satya. She draws such nice pictures, but I bet she's dropping F-bombs all day at school. Or maybe Henry. He pretends to me during morning drop-off that all he does is cutely play Legos all day. But I bet he's he, at, at school he's saying F this, F that all day long. And my daughter must have just innocently picked up the F-bomb without knowing what that means. But then I started doing some research online. And I guess the general consensus is that young kids usually start repeating new words within a week of learning those words. Did I mention that we were in week six of Shelter in Place? All right, fam, who, was, who has she been talking to this past week? Yeah, she just FaceTimed with Grandma and Grandpa Milligan a few days ago. Well, what kind of grandparents would teach our children the F-bomb? They seem so elderly and sweet. Although Grandpa Dick was in the Navy and at, one, at, at one point, and you know what they say about sailors. So disturbing and so disappointing, WTF. Except I didn't say WTF. Well, when I realized I'm a bad parent who's taught my child how to drop the F-bomb, I started to think in a half type pool type of way, right? I'm a half pool type of person. I started to think, what positive can we take out of the fact that our daughter has started dropping the F-bomb at such an early age? Well, again, contrasting with my youth, I was born in the 1970s and my incremental and stunted path towards the F-bomb took place during the 1980s. There were a lot of things wrong then. Despite the gains of the civil rights movement and the second feminist movement, the emergence of the gay rights movement and other movements for equality, we had a long ways to go on that front. There's plenty of inequality and homelessness was surging in major cities throughout the country. We were in a cold war with the Soviet Union where a nuclear war at least seemed possible, if, not, if still quite unlikely. We had blown a hole in the ozone layer which mandated, mandated behavioral changes to protect us from the effects of the sun. The problems we faced were real, but there was a sense that if we could make incremental progress year by year, we could overcome these challenges. If we could make incremental progress in advancing civil rights, we could secure something close to equality across our many different identities. If we could make incremental progress, we could lessen inequality and solve the homeless, homelessness problem. If we could make incremental progress in waging the Cold War against the Soviet Union, then the threat of nuclear war would continue to diminish. If we can make incremental progress in removing those pollutants causing ozone damage, we could patch up that hole in the ozone layer. In that context, my incrementalism towards the F-bomb made a lot of sense. It seemed to match the demands of the time. Things seem different now in 2020. Incrementalism has either led to progress that has been too slow, or progress that has been stalled or moved in the wrong direction due to backlash. And for some of the problems we face today, slow progress or no progress at all is failure that could have major repercussions. Slow progress in civil rights has produced some important gains, but backlash has contributed to losses of opportunity dignity, and even life. There's a killing of a man for jogging while black and an arrest that takes 74 hour days to happen. Another example that black lives still do not seem to matter that much to some people in America. There's an incitement of anti-Asian violence and hate for a virus whose only birthplace and home is in the body. There's a separation of families and detainment of people at the border seeking to escape violence at home for it or a better life. Their only fault is that they lost the birth lottery. There's the effort of, to deny trans people their identity and means of living according to who they are, because people, people think that they cannot be who they are. Now the hole in the ozone layer has been replaced by a planet getting hotter by the year, if not by the month or the day. And this will render many places uninhabitable by the end of the century, destroying the lives and livelihoods of millions, if not billions of people. It makes the existential risk of nuclear annihilation feel relatively inconsequential in comparison. And then there's the rising inequality that the pandemic in induced recession or depression will only exacerbate. Home, health, and food insecurity is already on the rise and it will only get worse. 
And if the middle class and wealthy think that this will not impact them, they need to think again, because it will. The time for incremental change is passing. We can no longer afford the gradual progression from Dang to Hoover Dam to Dam to ultimately the F-bomb. My four-year-old has gotten it exactly right. We need to start dropping F-bombs, and we need to start dropping them now. Kiara? That was wonderful. Thank you, uh, Professor Ross. Um, so my, my second life lesson and your third life lesson of the last lecture um, is to open yourself up to new possibilities. So I was telling you about my dance career during my first um, life lesson, and I was telling you about all the joy um, that it has brought me. All of that is true, um, but it is also true that to be a professional dancer, you have to say no to a lot of things. Um, in order to train at least three hours a day, you have to say no to sleep. Um, when my grandmother died, I missed her funeral because she died close to Christmas and I was dancing the Sugar Plum Fairy in a production of The Nutcracker that year and I just could not get away long enough to attend her funeral. Um, I never took up running because as a dancer, you just can't jeopardize your ankles, knees, and hips. So saying no becomes second nature when you are a dancer. When I finally went um, on the market to get a position as a law professor, I had no plans to stop dancing. I didn't see a need to stop dancing. I knew that I could teach my classes and write law review articles while training three hours a day, rehearsing on the weekends and performing during the summer. That's essentially what I had done all throughout grad school. The only issue was that I had to land a job at a law school that was in or close to New York City. So let me explain. In most places in the, in the world, and certainly in the United States, in order to dance professionally, you have to join a company. And most large to mid-sized cities have ballet companies. So we can talk about Miami City Ballet and Houston Ballet and Philadelphia Ballet and yada, yada, yada. The list goes on and on. The issue is that if you are in a ballet company, you have to be at work from at least nine to five for six days out of the week. And even I will admit that it is difficult to teach classes in a law school and write law review articles while having another job that requires you to be there from nine to five, six days out of the week. So being a professional dancer and being a law professor is mostly incompatible, except if you live in New York City. New York City is the only city in the world, with the exception of London maybe, where you can have a full-on dance career without being part of a major company. This is simply because New York is the center of the arts world. Everybody moves to New York when they are pursuing a career in the arts. So you have aspiring choreographers, aspiring dancers, aspiring musicians, aspiring costume designers, aspiring set designers, all in one place. The conditions are created where there can be a major dance scene that does not consist of one major ballet company. In New York City, there are about five major dance companies, but there are about 10 times as many smaller companies. Importantly, these smaller companies don't keep regular hours. They are not working from nine to five every day. Now nah, they're rehearsing from seven to 11 p.m. at night, and I remember those 11 p.m. rehearsals, right? They're rehearsing on the weekends. They're touring during the summer. All of that to say, if I wanted to keep dancing professionally while simultaneously having a, uh, being a law professor, I needed to get a job in a law school that was close to New York City. And I chose to go to Boston University for my first law teaching job in large part because Boston is a train ride away from New York City. In other words, I said no to a lot of schools because I was a dancer. And I continued to say no throughout my first decade as a law professor. Could I teach in the mornings? Nope. I have to go to ballet class. Could I teach Thursday afternoons? Nope. <laughs> I have to be on the train to New York City. UCLA asked me if I wanted to be a visiting professor for a year. Nope. LA's far from New York, but I want to travel to Haiti over the summer to do this amazing ethnographic study of humanitarian aid in the country. Nah, can't do it. So in very important ways, being a dancer expanded my world, but in other ways, it also made it incredibly small. Fast forward nine years into this. One night I'm at home in Boston, New York. I can't remember which. I'm minding my own business. How do I know? Because I'm always minding my own business. Ring, ring, cell phone rings, pick it up. Who this? Bertrand Ross. What does Bertrand Ross want? He wants to know if I would like to be considered for a position at UC Berkeley School of Law. That phone call terrified me, y'all. My instinct was to say, nope, Bertrand Ross. <laughs> because what would it mean to say yes to that? 
Would I be able to dance in the Bay Area? And if I was not able to dance, then what? Would I still be a dancer? I've always been a dancer since I was three years old. Is a person who no longer dances still a dancer? And if I wasn't a dancer, then who was I? Who would I be in California? Who would I be if I was not always running to New York City to go to rehearsal? Who would I be if that incredible feeling that you get after you've exhausted yourself in a really hard performance it was just something that I used to feel? Who would I be if I did not organize my life around making it to ballet class every morning? So clearly, I said yes to Bertrand Ross. <laughs> yes, Bertrand, I would like to be considered for a position at UC Berkeley School of Law, and I got the job. And I opened myself up to new possibilities. I packed all of my things and moved as far away from New York City as one can while still staying within the continental United States. This chapter of my life is still being written. And I don't have slides that show you all the incredible things that happened when I opened myself up to new possibilities and moved to California, but I will say this. This past weekend, I looked out of my window and it was beautiful and I wanted to be outside. So I put on some sweatpants, the only cowl sweatshirt that I currently own and a ratty pair of sneakers. And I went outside and I started running. I live in Jack London Square. So I ran over to the water and then I ran down the boardwalk and then I ran over to Chinatown and I was feeling good. So I kept running. I ran over to Lake Merritt, felt great. And so I ran around the lake and then I ran back to Chinatown and then I stopped and bought um, a lychee bubble tea. <laughs> so y'all, my calves are still sore to the touch and I'm not sure that my IT bands will ever be the same. Also, I'm not sure I'll ever go running again. <laughs> but I said yes to running, which is something that I've always said no to because it jeopardized my ability to dance. By moving to California, I have opened myself up to new possibilities. And with that comes the opportunity to have new experiences, learn new things, discover new joys. And I fully expect that in 10 years, I'm going to have the most amazing PowerPoint presentation to show y'all about what happened to me when I let my world get bigger than what it has always been. I'll turn it back over to Mr. Professor Ross. <laughs> I say, Professor Bridges, thank you so much for saying yes. And I remember um, the stories I was told about you being a dancer and like you weren't going to come from the East Coast. And I was like, yeah, we just got to put it out there and see if she may change her mind. I'm so grateful that she did. Uh, it's wonderful having you as part of our community. Uh, so the second part of my lecture is titled of, a of Assholes and Angels. So there are assholes in this world. There are angels in this world. There are assholes in this law school. There are angels in this law school. Although what makes Berkeley Law great is that there are fewer assholes and more angels, um, according to the most recent scientific study, that has not yet been peer reviewed or written, but I'm sure it will be soon. But the proportion of pure assholes and angels is quite low. According to my scientific study of people I've come across in my life, I'd say about 5% of people in the world and 2% of Berkeley Law students are pure assholes. And 5% of the people in this world and about 7.2% of Berkeley Law students are pure angels. What that means is that 90% of us are a mixture of asshole and angel. Now I admire angels greatly. Their ability and willingness to sacrifice for the common good without regard to self is simply extraordinary and something that is desperately needed and undervalued in this world. Angels are the definition of true sacrifice. And we are seeing angel-like behavior every day as we work through this pandemic from people putting their lives at risk to save and serve others. And then there are the assholes. For the assholes, the common good is equated with their own good. Their empathy for the less fortunate is non-existent as they tend to attribute fault to others for their less fortunate condition. They follow the man mantra of Gordon Gecko from the movie Wall Street, greed, for lack of a better word, is good. We would like to forget about pure assholes if only they weren't on TV seemingly every day. But there is something valuable in assholes as they can serve as an important barometer that can check our own descent into asshole dumb. Because the rea reality is that the remaining 90% of us, 91.8% of Berkeley Law students, are a combination of asshole and angel. From a societal perspective, being an angelic asshole is obviously not as good as being an angel, but it's not as bad as just being an asshole, but it's perhaps the most human thing one can be. 
It is also the most challenging thing one can be as we constantly struggle with our inner asshole to be more angelic in our behavior and treatment of others. This struggle takes on added significance when more angelic behavior might be critical to the survival of the human race. Now, I'm not here to tell you that the class of 20, 2020 needs to be more angelic in behavior to save the world. I find it extraordinarily frustrating, in fact, when I hear commitment speeches, I appear to place the burden of solving the world's problems on the class that just graduated. What kind of graduation present is that? I recently read about one speech describing the class of 2020 as a chosen one. No offense, but y'all are no more chosen than the class of 2019, 2018, 1950, 1822, or 462 BC, and that was a remarkable class. Now we all have a responsibility to this world as we move forward, and what graduation should be is a reminder of that responsibility in hopes that you will let all those who have forgotten that it is on them to conquer their struggle between their inner angel and asshole to make it the world a better place. Now, what does it mean to conquer that struggle? I really wish I had an answer to that question. But I'll tell you about my own struggle in hopes that there can be lessons derived from it. The best years of my youth were, li were, were, were living in a trailer home in Paris, California. There I grew up with my grandparents and three foster kids that they raised. I slept on the couch in the living room for all those years and it didn't seem all that remarkable to me and I actually came to enjoy falling asleep with the TV on and chatter all around me. I just felt connected and part of the unit. My family was a paycheck to paycheck family. I won't say that we were poor because my grandma and grandpa did bring home paychecks, but things were certainly tight financially. I remember trips to the grocery store in which my grandmother would use me as her human calculator to calculate the cost of every item she put into the grocery cart to make sure she did not exceed the amount of money she had to pay for the groceries. I learned to stop asking for the brand name cereal and the brand name treats because as I worked through the human calculation of groceries, I knew we could not afford it. Now, I remember the ultimate treat that occurred maybe once a month, sometimes once every couple weeks, when we would stop by Subway or Shakey's Pizza and bring home restaurant food for dinner. All of this was pretty unremarkable to me as it was just how I grew up and in the unincorporated part of town in which we lived, the others around us seemed to live exactly as we did. I remember attending Nan Sanders Elementary School for fourth grade and Good Hope Elementary School for fifth and sixth grade. Worn down clothing, holes in the shoes, that's just what we wore as kids. I thought in fifth grade that Mrs. Schmidt was the best teacher ever and that I knew that if I could avoid being dumped into the trash can, head down by the bully, Robert, it was a good day. Little did I know about my relative economic depri deprivation until I went to college. It was a state school, the University of Colorado, but the students there did not live like I lived. My freshman year, I worked 35 hours a week, 20 of which was in the dorm eatery, washing dishes and serving food. A certain embarrassment became attached to my status as I would try to hide when friends from the dorm came through the food line. I decided that anything would be, would be worth it not to work that much, so when the financial aid department offered me more loans instead, I thought, well, why not? Not really knowing what it meant to carry debt. From then, I was able to reduce my work to 20 hours a week in a library mailroom. Then after graduation, two years in London, two years in Princeton, three years at Yale, brought, brought tremendous growth to my inner asshole. Not in my treatment of others, but in the desire to make money and live a comfortable life. My reference point was my family and how I grew up. And while part of the goal of making money was to be able to provide for my family, which I guess is evidence of that my inner angel is still alive, I wanted that better life that I saw so many of my classmates and their families enjoy. I wanted a comfortable home and the financial security associated with money saved up when things go wrong. I did not want to, I did not want to need a calculator, human or otherwise, when grocery shopping. I wanted to bring home pizza, sandwiches, and even more glamorous Thai or Japanese food whenever I wanted, and even eat in at the restaurant when the children permitted. And I've achieved that comfortable life. It was not lacking in fear of economic insecurity, that fear will always be with me, but my life is certainly far from what it was as a child. But in that achievement, the challenge has been to revive the inner angel and to move away from hoarding for a potentially insecure future to giving more to others. The pandemic has reminded me that it is not enough to engage in nominal charitable giving every month, to handing money to the homeless person standing on the corner, to recycle or engage in the disgusting process of composting. It is not enough to simply provide services to students I care about deeply in our privileged institution at the law school. It requires more, and I know it. 
Now, I'm at an early stage in the evolution towards reviving my inner angel and constraining my inner asshole, and sheltering in place has posed some obstacles. But I found as a first step that when I give more than I think I can, that I can, uh, uh, that I find that when I give more than I think I can give, that I can easily give more. But there is so much more that I need to do and that I need to give. And to the extent that my, challenge, that my challenges between my inner angel and asshole describe your own, recognize that you are not alone. A thing I do a lot these days is watch Ken Burns documentaries. And there's a quote from a letter in one of them that I had to write down that's a perfectly described my inner struggle. Meriwether Lewis, who was part of the Lewis and Clark expedition, suffered from depression. It was during these moments of depression that he provided reflection that, that probably painted his life in a more negative light than perhaps accorded with reality. In that letter, he reflected, I've yet done but little, very little indeed, to further the happiness of the human, human race or to advance the information of the succeeding generations. I view it with great regret the many hours I have spent with indolence and how so and now sorely feel the want of that information which those hours would have given me if they had been judiciously, judiciously expended. But since they are past and cannot be recalled, I dash from me the gloomy thought and resolve to redouble my, redouble my exertion to in the future live for mankind as, I've, as I have herefore, heretofore lived for myself. For me and perhaps for you, it may be impossible to move into the category of pure angel. So I've set for myself a realistic goal of engaging in true sacrifice that is sustainable for me to think about ways to do that. For you, as you move on in life, I hope that your inner angel will not be forgotten because when it is forgotten, the inner asshole will thrive. We just can't afford a world with more assholes. Professor Bridges. Thank you. So um, Bertrand and I agreed that he would do the introduction if I did the conclusion. So I'm going to do the conclusion. And I would like to conclude by saying, y'all win. The class of 2020 wins. Up until this year, I thought that the class of 20, uh, 2002 had the best law school story, especially folks who went to law school in New York City like me. Um, so in the fall of 2001, I was a 3L at Columbia Law in my second to last uh, semester in law school. In that semester, I had federal income tax from 925 to 1050 on Tuesday mornings. So September 11th, 2001 was a Tuesday. The first plane struck the first of the Twin Towers at 846 AM. The second plane struck the second tower at 903 AM. And the towers did not fall for another hour. I didn't turn on the TV that morning. I, I usually didn't. And I usually didn't listen to the radio in the morning. So on the morning of 9-11, I woke up, put on my clothes, and walked over to the law school for Fed tax class like it was any other day. And I actually didn't hear that terrorists had flown two planes into the Twin Towers until I was at the law school. I remember my tax professor walking into the classroom that morning and saying we were going to have class that day because, quote, whoever did this doesn't want us to learn about tax. I'm not exactly sure that's true, but he started class at 9.25 a.m. While I was learning about stepped up bases or something like that, the towers fell. And we didn't find out that they had fallen until after we got out of class. And that's actually when the gravity of the situation hit me. Um, Columbia canceled classes for the rest of the day um, and everybody went home. And when I got home, there was nothing to do except watch these terrifying images of the planes flying into the towers and people trapped in the buildings choosing not to burn alive, but rather to jump to their deaths and of towers collapsing as firefighters ran towards them. And there is only so much of that that you can take. So I turned off the TV and forced myself to take a nap. Um, when I woke up an hour or so later, the entire apartment smelled like smoke. The smoke from downtown had finally reached uptown. And in fact, fires burned under the rubble of the Twin Towers for the next three or so months. So all of New York City smelled like smoke, um, at least until January, at least until January. So that was my 3L year. Being in Fed tax while the towers fell, smelling smoke for the rest of the semester, and then of course, witnessing the US embark on a war on terrorism that has functioned to demonize and disenfranchise Muslim people and people who might be mistaken for Muslims. For close to two decades, the class of 2002 has held the crown for the most badass law school story. But the class of 2020 wins, hands down. Y'all did law school in the midst of a global pandemic. 
Y'all did law school on an application that white supremacists like to hack into. Like this application had zero security features. <laughs> Y'all did law school as we transitioned from life as we have always known it to life in the age of Rona. I was terrified in 2001. And perhaps my fear prevented me from realizing that 9-11 presented an amazing opportunity to do something different. We could do what we have always done and go on the hunt for terrorists, or we can investigate what leads us to call some people who kill terrorists while denying that label to others. We could do what we have always done and engage in a war, this time against terrorism, or we can investigate the structural and political conditions that lead some people to engage in acts that the nation calls terrorism. We could do what we have always done and try to protect American lives by dropping bombs and conducting airstrikes and occupying countries and torturing bodies and taking their life. Or we could do something different. With the benefit of 19 years of hindsight, I think it is safe to conclude that we didn't do anything different after 9-11. I hope that the rational fears that this diva of a novel coronavirus has given us do not prevent us from re realizing that it presents us with an amazing opportunity to do something different. We could continue to provide health insurance in this country largely through employers so that when you lose your job, you lose your ability to access health care, or we could erect a system that makes a little bit more sense. We can construct a public health infrastructure that could competently respond to both public health emergencies as well as less acute public health challenges, or we could leave in place the system that we currently have, which has left us with 80,000 people dead and counting, and one of the wealthiest nations in the world. We could respect animals' habitats and recognize that our survival is wrapped up in theirs, or we can continue encroaching, increasing the likelihood that this will not be the last novel virus that we encounter. I could go on. The poet Rumi once wrote, the wound is the place where the light enters you. COVID-19 has wounded us. What a gift. Let's let in as much light as we possibly can. Now go out there and save the world, class of 2020. <laughs> Congratulations, class of 2020. <laughs> Love you all. I know, we really do. <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor Bridges and Professor Ross. It, this was such an incredible reminder of why you two are some of our most beloved professors at Berkeley. We really appreciate you taking the time to share your advice with us and your stories and your lives. We, we appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you. It's been a joy. Thank all of the angelic assholes that you guys are and some of your angels like Liv and Kiki. <laughs> thank you. All. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you all. That's it! <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye! Bye.